around and disregard it. Sweep you off the ground, show you what heart is. Standing strong and proud of the Panakis. Let's get it started. It's the hardest. Talk around and disregard it. Sweep you off the ground, show you what heart is. Standing strong and proud of the Panakis. Let's get it started. Yeah, get your boots ready. We're about to go on a trip where we wrestle. Nobody settling or calling it quits. You're here for the grit. Betcha this stuff is amazing. You're stumbling. Welcome to the bump in the apron. Step into it. The hardest part of the ring. Here to bring fun. Yeah, in this art, he is king. It's the best thing. Making sure you don't tap out. Don't go soft with the hardest podcast out. And it's not just another one. It's clear. Off the rest in this content, none can test. Take the nonsense off the steps. You know it's nothing but. Pure your gems when it's coming off the chest get it now it's time to sit and relax get your mind blown away ain't no skipping a track have you paying more attention no listening gap get everything i ever wanted you're giving it back yeah what's up everybody welcome to the apron bump podcast i'm your host the hardest part of the ring kyle how is everybody doing today hope everybody's Hope everybody's ready to go cross the pond. And I ain't talking Perth. Trying to be topical. No, we are talking Progress Wrestling Chapter 34, Chapter 35. We're looking at Progress Wrestling in August of 2016. Continuing the 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 gallivant through the history of Progress Wrestling. Very go kind of topical um, nowadays. I know Rev Pro just had a big show. Will Osprey's last uh, last independent match, I believe, if I have that correct. If I'm wrong on that, um, come into my house and uh, tickle me until I come. So, uh, <laughs> so vulgar for no reason. I'm sorry. It's like my defense mechanism is just to resort to that. Uh, this is a very highbrow podcast, and I will continue <laughs> in that direction. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about progress. Oh, that's right. We're talking about the Rev Pro show. Rev Pro making some making some waves nowadays. The entire British wrestling's wrestling. The British. Br- I'm having a stroke. Daddy's having a stroke. Uh, the entire British wrestling scene seems to be on the up and up here in 2024. Um, for various reasons, uh, 2020 was not a good year for British wrestling, but good to see that there's some, still some, uh, big shows over there with some buzz and, um, this is all very relevant because Will Ospreay is a major, major, uh, focal point this month, this month being August of 2016. Like I mentioned, um, we see kind of a, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it, but definitely some character. Um, strategy, trajectory. We got some stuff happening with Will Ospreay, and it's very thought provoking. Actually, weirdly, <laughs> it's like not very obvious where they're going with it, which I like. It uh, it's piquing my interest. Uh, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. And he's in some pretty dandy matches here because we're gonna be talking about two shows. We got Chapter Thirty Four from Progress. Occurring on August 14th, 2016 from Manchester, England. And then we got chapter 35 occurring on August 28th, 2016. So about two weeks after and uh, from the Electric Ballroom in London, their home base kind of sort of. So uh, what are we going to be talking about today? We got a lot of good stuff to talk about here. Um, Really the entire I would say the umbrella that encapsulates everything, and I ain't talking about Marty Skrull, uh, 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 the umbrella that encapsulates both chapters and really a lot of the previous chapters that we've been talking about, which, by the way, if you want to get up to speed, you want to hop on this journey from the beginning, go to apronbump.com, go to the episodes tab at the top, and you can select whatever era or promotion you'd like to hear me recap chronologically i do a lot of different timelines on this podcast we do the monday night wars we do ruthless aggression attitude era tna ring of honor the golden eras 
of a lot of these promotions from companies big and small across four different decades. So, but if you want to hop on the progress train, you want to live it, relive it from the beginning, from chapter one all the way, going through each chapter up until now, you can select progress wrestling and uh, that'll filter it down to all the progress reviews that I've done by, by myself and with various other guests some are very knowledgeable about the entire history of progress. Some were a part of progress and uh, I've introduced a lot of people to progress too. So lots of different flavors of stuff and uh, lots of major stars today went through, uh, went through this company. So give it a check out ski and apron bump on all the social, just let me plug shit out of the way. Apron bump on all the social medias, TikTok, Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, all that shit's. Like, review, subscribe, join the Discord. All this is in the description. But let's get into it, baby. Chapter 34, chapter 35. And um oh, as I was, I keep like interrupting my myself somehow. Um <laughs> but, uh we are building to progress's biggest show to date, which will occur on uh at chapter 36 the following month at uh Brixton. So it'll be occurring at the O2 Academy in Brixton, which is, uh, forgive me, I'm not too familiar on uh, <laughs> uh, European geography, but from my understanding, it's like a, a portion of the O2 in London, England, uh, but holds, I think the show, and by the way, towards the end of this, we'll kind of look forward um, as far as what the card is for Brixton. Which is essentially, they've been building it as their WrestleMania for progress. The biggest show that they've done to date. And there'll be about 2,400 people in attendance. And for reference, these, these shows that I've covered so far, they've capped out at about 700 people. Now, keep them, they're, they're jamming people in, but they're getting a bigger room to uh, accommodate the, the, uh, the increased buzz that progress is getting at this point in 2016. We're entering a really... Hot, hot period for British wrestling. So looking forward to that. But basically, these two cards that we're going to be talking about, we're building to that. We're building to that big show. But we also got some really big matches uh, on the way there that we'll talk about. We're going to talk about Will Ospreay and his journey this month, which is very interesting and very, very interesting matches, too. Um, we got the tag team championships. We got a tag match on night one. And um, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll be referring to night one and night two. Night one being the Manchester show uh, on the 14th. Night two being the London show on the 28th. So, But the tag team championships are defended on night one. And then we got the number one contendership on the line on night two. So we're building to that tag team title match at Brixton. We're uh, finalizing the Atlas championship finals, which... The first Atlas champion will be crowned at Brixton as well. And, uh, of course, Brixton being chapter 36 for, uh, did I say that already? Probably not. Um, we got some women's division action that we'll be covering. Got some debuts in the women's division of people that may or may not be on WWE TV nowadays. And, uh, of course we got the world title, uh, one being defended. And also, we got some number one contenderships. We got potential three ways being created at Brixton. So, and some other tomfoolery along the way. But that's generally what we'll be talking about today. But let's start it off with Will Ospreay. I mean, I'm just so eager <laughs> to get to the. I mean, let me just set the scene here, all right? So, Will Ospreay, at this point, for context in 2016, he has uh, just won the Battle of the Super Juniors in New Japan. So Will's making a big name for himself in New Japan, which a lot of people listening, that's probably where you first heard of him, or at least it's where you are most familiar with his work. Now, of course, he's about to debut in AEW as of recording this, but New Japan is kind of where Will Ospreay really exploded in, on the global scale, I would, I would say. So why that's important is that his priorities are kind of coming into question. You know, how much time can he dedicate to wrestling on the British scene? And he actually makes a note of that in a promo here, um, which we'll get into. But it's very interesting because Will, he like, he like grew up in British wrestling. Like 
when I say that, I mean like he started out as a scrawny dude, just one half of another high flying tag team, eventually broke out on his own, kind of cultivated his own character, bulked up a little bit, showed his star power, and he was the one that ultimately uh, dethroned Jimmy Havoc, which was a major thread throughout chapter 10 through 20. So Will, he's like the progress guy. He's the poster boy of the company, arguably, at this point. And he hasn't wrestled a ton in 2016. He lost the title to Marty Skrull earlier in the year, I believe, and hasn't really... Because like I said, he was just in New Japan, so he's been doing a lot of that. I'm sure he's been wrestling in the States as well. It's almost like he's starting to outgrow this, or at least like that's how he perceives it. And he, he's, it's, it's kind of like a seesaw battle. Like as a fan watching this, right? And I could be totally wrong. Like I said, I'm going through progress in real time as if this was happening. Like I don't know what happens. I don't, I don't know what happens with his character going forward. Uh, after this, if he, how much he's a part of progress, but and we kind of touched on this on chapter 33 when he lost to Mark Haskins and a lot of that match he was being very cocky and let's also for context, remember 2016 we got plucky babyface Will Ospreay the high flying, you know, the classic exciting, you know, shaking the ropes, hopping up to the top rope beating your chest, babyface he's not the cocky dickhead that he is now uh, bruv. So he's starting, but here he's starting to get a little cocky. He's starting to be a bit of a dickhead and, but he's trying to like bottle it up, which is like interesting to watch because it's like relatively subtle. You know what I mean? It seems like basically bottom line here is like, it seems like we're working towards a Will Ospreay heel turn, um, which is very significant. Like, cause like I said, he was the top baby face in the promotion for pretty much up, up until this point. So it's interesting to see that kind of transition with Will. But how does this happen? Well, let's start off with night one, naturally. When he takes on, he being Will Ospreay, we have Will Ospreay versus Zack Sabre Jr. Never heard of him. We got ZSJ versus Ospreay here in the main event of night one. And uh, just should, be, should note... That this is a rematch of the super strong style 16 tournament from a couple of years ago. And we got the best aerial wrestler in the world going up against the best technical wrestler of the world. So a huge main event on night one. And it's uh, we got the Yeti here, apparently, because Zack Sabre Jr. comes out with his head wrapped in tape, like his entire head. Well, not his like eyes and shit, but like the top of his head wrapped in tape. I guess he busted his head open on a ring post wrestling in Germany um, shortly before this. I don't know if it was the night before or a couple nights before, um, but he had to get a bunch of stitches in his head. So that's why his head is all wrapped up. And that kind of comes into play in this match because, look, we got Will Ospreay, Zack Sabre Jr., two good guys, two fan favorites. Will is trying to be a, uh, a polite bloke by not attacking the head. So he doesn't strike the head of uh, ZSJ in this match. I don't believe he does, or at least he tries not to. He tries to take a more technical approach, a more, uh, you know, attacking the body, you know, all the stuff he does at this point, the moon salts, the Phoenix splashes, the springboards, all that shit, right? And but the match starts out with uh, heavy chain wrestling, and naturally, you know, Zach's going to, have the upper hand as far as that goes, but I mean, Zach is just tying Will in knots. There's one point where Zach has Will tied up in the ropes, like upside down. I don't know how to describe it. It's like, you know, it's a Jiri's tarantula. Well, imagine that, but Will is like within the ropes, hanging upside down, and Zach just like kicks the rope so that the rope like guillotines his. I don't. I, 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 Zach, I think just makes shit up as he goes. I don't know if it's an actual move, but, um, some really, you know, fun stuff here in the, uh, the opening part of that match, various submissions and leg locks and neck locks from Zach kind of dominating Will Ospreay here for like the first half of this match. But <laughs> Will has a really slick counter out of a, uh, 
like a bow and arrow type move. He like counters out of the bow and arrow and like one fluid motion does a handspring elbow up against the ropes, bounces back, hit Zach. And uh, it's at that point where uh, Will starts to fire up, you know, throwing, I guess him and Okada are buddies. I think they're in the same faction at this point in New Japan. So he's trying to throw rainmakers, but it keeps getting countered. I mean, I just noted like a few spots in this match that really caught my eye. Like, like Zach goes for a flying European uppercut, but Will catches him in midair in a backslide pin, which I mean, the coordination for that is just unreal, dude. Because Will's throwing out all of his big stuff, but Zach keeps countering. Um, so at some point, Will gets really fed up and just starts throwing these like really brutal knees. Like Zach's on the ground, and Will's just like kneeing them, kneeing the shit out of him in the ribs. Like Zach's in the ropes too, and Will just won't stop. The ref's trying to get him off, but Will's like, "No, let me get this. Let me get this. Cult. Let me get this. <laughs> let me let me get this skinny." mummy wrapped piece of shit and the crowd's starting to boom a little bit because Zach's in the ropes but Will didn't care so we're starting to see that that frustration within Will because like I said he hasn't won in 2016 yet in progress and you can see him his 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 anger starting to boil up so but ultimately that being said Zach Saber Jr is able to lock in a cobra twist which, for those unaware, it's like an abdominal stretch, but with the outer leg wrapped around Will's head while also kicking him in the head somehow. He's a very, he's a very wiry boy, this Zack Sabre Jr. I don't know how he puts his limbs in these places. Um, and I should note that this submission, this Cobra Twist submission with a kick to the head, uh, it has a name. And the name of this move, uh, according to RJ Singh on commentary, is Hurrah! Another year. Surely this will be better than the last. The inexorable march of progress will lead us all to happiness. That's the name of the movie. <laughs> this fucking asshole. Um, I don't even know what that's a reference to. Let's Google that. What even is that? It is a 2004 EP by post rock band Youth Movie Soundtrack Strategies. Uh, this doesn't. This doesn't clarify anything to me, but whatever. Uh, obscure reference aside, Zack Sabre Jr. gets the win here over Will Ospreay. Uh, I mean, just a great match. I mean, you see these two guys on paper. You, you kind of know what you're going to get. And uh, they delivered on expectations, I would say. Maybe the, maybe the match of the month. It's top three for sure. And spoiler alert, another one in the top three is another Will Ospreay match. But... Uh, before we get there, just wanted to shout out that match and uh, love the story of Will kind of fighting his inner demons a little bit by not striking Zach in the head, but kind of being a dickhead by kneeing him while in the ropes. It's all very subtle and I like it. It's very gradual. We're doing a crescendo here to a potential heel turn for Will. At least it's what it seems like from uh, from the naked eye and I am naked. So. But like he's keeping it all inside. He's like bottling up this. He's bottling up this anger, but that kind of leads to his downfall a bit. So, and on the other hand, for Zack Saber Jr., we are also building to Brixton, and Zack and Tommaso Ciampa are going to have their rubber match because they've faced each other twice before in progress. They've each won one match apiece, so they're going to have a two out of three falls match at Chapter Thirty Six. So Zack comes out of this looking like a killer all the more build for that match as well. So love it. Love it. And um, seeing Will kind of spiral here, but hey, maybe he'll turn it around, right? Because he has another chance at victory here on night two this month when he takes on Swerve Strickland. <laughs> and holy shit. So I've actually seen, I saw this on Twitter the other day. Uh, somebody was asking, in terms of current day AEW, they were asking, is Swerve versus Will Ospreay, is that like the biggest match they could have at Wembley this year? And I saw that and I was like, well, gee, Willikers, pal, I'm about to watch their 2016 match. Let me let me watch it and get back to you. Now, I will say also, I did kind of recently, they had a match this year in 2016 for WXW in the 16 karat gold tournament. 
which I'll, there's, there's a clip that was kind of floating around of uh, Will and Swerve having a dance off in the ring, which was something. Um, but they followed that dance off with a killer match, the match of the entire tournament. The 16 karat gold is like one of the most prestigious tournaments in Europe. So um, they stole the tournament, I thought, so for sure. So surely I was uh, throb throbbing at the mouth, frothing at the mouth. I mean, I was also throbbing as well, but um, not in the mouth. My penis. So, Swerve, Osprey, Night 2, London. Spoiler alert. It was a saucy match. I mean, gee willikers, this was... Let me, let me tell you guys something. First, like, I mean, t- taking notes for these, like, fast-paced matches is virtually impossible. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to just kind of like digest everything like with your mind as you're watching this. This match starts off like you, you could see like they're both waiting for the bell. And the second that it rings, they sprint towards each other and then just go to work. I mean, they're just bumping each other against the ropes, hitting the ropes, doing moonsaults over each other. There's a point where Swerve throws a roundhouse get, kick, but... Osprey does a backflip to evade it. They're trying to throw each other into the ropes, but they keep like parkouring off of the corner and bouncing out of the ring, in the ring. They're throwing kicks. They're doing flips. They're doing moss-covered, three-handled family credenzas. Like, this match has it all, dude. 2016 Swerve versus 2016 Osprey. It's a very different match than it would be today. But these guys at this point, while they might be smaller in stature, you know, they, they, they've put on a lot, of, a lot of muscle in these, what, eight years. But they both had them. I mean, they're still both pretty high flying based. But 2016, man, gee willikers. It's um, well, actually, before. Before we get into the match itself, let's talk about Swerve's music. Because that's like his whole thing today, right? His the, the Nana dance, Swerve when he drives, that whole thing. Which is like a pretty badass song. It's very like, I guess ominous. It's like s- kind of slow, but it's also like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe music. It, it's, it's like, it's, it's got some bass to it and you can dance to it, but it's kind of methodical. With that in mind... Here's what he came out to in 2016. A little different than today, I would say. But so I'm like watching this match, right? And I would say this match is kind of like two parts. It's the first half and the second half. First half is very, you know, like I, what I just described. It's a lot of high flying, a lot of intricate, kind of like both guys are high flying. So they're trying to out high fly each other. So it's a lot of acrobatics. It's a lot of, uh, dare I say, choreographed spots. As a lot of people would describe them. And I wouldn't say that they're wrong. What do I think about this style, though, is the question. Because I see, because, you know, Osprey and Ricochet, like, that's like the go-to one. I think it might have been around this time, too, is when, like, Vader was <laughs> bitching about them. And people is like, this is when it really kind of became a topic of discussion online about this style of, like, are, are they working too much together? Does it feel like a fight? Can you immerse yourself in it, or is it just like a Cirque du Soleil performance more than a wrestling match? And to me, man, I think there's a time and a place for this, right? As I was watching this match, I wasn't sitting there like, oh, these guys are just, they're just dancing together. They're just doing a trapeze artist performance. Like, yeah, of course, like it's pro wrestling, but I thought it worked in the context of this match, especially with how it ended. I thought, 
the intensity was there. I thought there was a good amount of intent with everything they were doing. And I was kind of questioning that too, because the, the dance off that I brought up earlier from a few months before this, I was like, okay, are they going to try to recreate that? Is this match going to be of the same vein? Is it going to be like comedy? But it wasn't. It was a very serious match, and I fucking loved it. I think I might put this a, a hair above the, the, the Will and Zach match. Maybe. But they're like very close, and in my opinion, might waver, you know, depending on the hour that you ask me. So overall, man, just an incredibly entertaining match. There's one spot where fucking Will's on the apron, Swerve is in the ring. Swerve charges Will. Will does a moonsault, lands on his feet on the floor. At the same time, Swerve does a front flip over the top rope and lands on his feet. So they both land on their feet on the floor at the same time. And then Swerve pops up Will, and then he lands on the second rope and does an SI moonsault to the outside. This is very hard to kind of articulate, to kind of paint a picture, because it's just all in, like... It's it's so like I was saying like you can't you can't take notes on this shit you can barely even understand what's happening as you're watching it in real time so very impressive stuff here but the reason that I don't mind this kind of uh, this style here in this context is because the match progressively gets more aggressive you know they're doing all the acrobatics at first but then more strikes come into play there's very stiff slaps and forearms and super kicks and stomps and they're you know brawling on the outside a little bit and i would say even the second half of this match is probably even better because that intensity ramp ramps up you got swerve swerve hits this fucking german suplex on will i've never seen anybody land on their head more than this this german suplex right here because a lot of times it's like oh they land on their head but they kind of rolled out of it they like let the momentum carry them forward. They tilted their heads so it wasn't like no. Will just penciled like into the ground, bounced up, and seemed to be fine somehow. But uh, that was pretty scary. Will fights back with with some strikes, hits a four fifty splash, but appears to injure his shoulder in the process. So Will. He's like clutching at his shoulder. He rolls to the outside of the ring. You know, you see kind of he's kind of sitting against the ring. Medical comes out. Refs come out. They're checking on him. But Will's like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm a valiant warrior. I'm going to get in there. And I'm going to fight through this injury because I, the progress fans deserve it. And I have fighting spirit and all of that stuff. So Will, he's clutching his shoulder. He, he, he rolls in the ring. He crawls to his feet. And then, bam! Will's playing possum. Throws a, some sort of kick at Swerve. Hits a Robinson special, which is that kind of like cyclone kick, trouble in paradise type move when the guy's like on his hands and knees and then he does like the twirl and then a kick to the back of the head. Kick, Robinson special. Goat hops right to the top. Spinning, shooting, star press. For a two count. Meanwhile, in the background, a chorus of boos. I haven't heard boos this loud since Jimmy Havoc was around. Well, other than Zach Gibson. But other than that, I mean, he, Will Ospreay has some heat, brother. Bruv. People, people are not happy with the bruv here. And there's even fuck you Will chance, which is... Insane, because a year before this, year and a half, whatever it was, Will was the top guy. He was the he was the chosen one. Like I said, he dethroned Jimmy Havoc. He was the guy, and now he's just a dickhead. Will, he gets a two count off that shooting star press, still kind of capitalizing off of the playing possum deal. Just now, now it's just ground and pound. He mounts a swerve, just starts just throwing haymakers and elbows and knees against a defenseless Swerve. He's just beating him into the ground. Swerve's in the ropes. He doesn't care. More booze. Goes for the Oss Cutter, but Swerve counters it, throws the middle finger at Will Ospreay, hits him with a kick, 
hits him with the swerve stomp from the top rope, and then hits him with the JML driver for the win. So all of this, all of that stuff that Will did, he still lost, and Swerve gets his win in his Progress Wrestling debut. So Swerve comes out the winner, and which makes Will look even <laughs> look even shittier because he's like, "Oh, I've, I turned my back just to lose." So it's at this point where Will tries to do some damage control, and I'm not talking about Bailey. Swerve wins. He starts leaving. Uh, Will grabs the mic. And he's like kind of unhinged. He's like very much like disheveled and he's he's like fighting to get his words out. And he's like, oh, look, look. And he basically he apologizes to the crowd. People are like yelling dick at him or whatever. And Will's like, yeah, no, you're right. I am a dick. I do. I, I deserve it. I shouldn't have done that. I don't know what came over me. Like it's, it's this whole thing, right? Like he's apologizing to the crowd. He's apologizing to Swerve. They, they eventually they shake hands. Swerve is still kind of like, oh, he kind of side eyes him when he does it. But they shake hands. Swerve leaves. And uh, Will basically. He's talking on the mic about how he's been very busy lately. He brings up how he won the Battle of the Super Juniors, how he's been in Japan a lot. And he's basically saying that. His his schedule has become very full. And progress basically isn't fitting into that schedule anymore. So he's he says that this isn't goodbye. It's what do you say? He's, he's like, it's not goodbye. It's pip pip cheerio. He, he says some stupid shit like that. But basically, he's saying goodbye to progress for the time being. So I don't know if he's taking a break or if this is all just a ruse of some sort. But seemingly, it's this seems to be the end of his full time. Uh, run in progress, which is very significant because, like I said, he's been the guy this as far as I've been covering progress. So we'll keep an eye on that. But I know he I know he comes back eventually. How significant a part he plays in progress, I'm not totally sure. But a very interesting uh, trajectory for Will Ospreay. By the way, two incredible matches as well of this story. So for that reason, I loved it. I loved all of that. So we'll keep an eye on that. But why don't we talk about the tag team titles, huh? Let's talk about some championships. Let's talk about some progress wrestling shields. That's right, folks. Still no championship belts. Still these dumbass shields that the London riots are carrying out to defend against War Machine. Y'all might know them as the Viking Raiders, Ivar and Eric. But no, we got the War Machine here. Hansen and Ray Rowe. So at chapter 33, the London riots and war machine had their first match in progress. And we talked about it in the previous episode, but that match, while it was pretty good, it was like there was something missing because if you know, like London riots, they're brawlers war machine. I mean, you guys probably know that the big Viking assholes with the, Big hairy chests and hairy thighs. Like, we're not looking for hammer locks and fucking European clutches and intricate chain wrestling count, which is like a lot of what that first match was. It was very technical. It was like surprisingly technical. It was like, let's see who's the better wrestler kind of thing. And it ended very abruptly with the riots getting a win via roll up with the tights held. So that cheeky victory also kind of lended a bit of um, bit of tension between the two teams because it was like, okay, you had to cheat to win. This is horse shit. But now we got a tornado style match at chapter 34, night one. And my goodness, this match was incredible. Holy shit. This this is what this is what daddy wanted from these two teams. Because like, look, the riots won. Their, their last match, they tried to shake the War Raiders' hands or the War Machine's hands, and they shook them, but they were still pissed. So to open up this match, the riots offer their hands to shake, but War Machine's like, "Nah, doggy, we ain't doing this again." Throwing hands immediately to the outside, people are getting thrown into the chairs ringside. They're brawling at the bar throwing each other into the post. They're slamming each other on the basketball floor. It is just gnarly 
from the gates. I mean, chop battles. There's just striking after strike. This Hanson, you know, there's chaos. Hanson comes through with a suicide dive on everybody. James Davis comes from the top rope with a flipping senton onto a pile of bodies. They're throwing knees. They're power bombing each other onto the apron. There's chair shots. And a lot of this match occurs on the outside of the ring. But it does, it does eventually work its way into the ring. But like I said, it's a tornado style match. So there's no tags necessary. So it's still chaotic even when it gets in the ring. But the best kind of chaotic. I mean, they, they, both teams are throwing out some really beast double teams. Uh, War Machine hits this combo in the corner where, like, Hanson will hit a splash in the corner. And then Roe will hit double knees in the corner. And then Hanson does a Bronco Buster in the corner. And then we pick him up. And then there's a double power bomb. And then we're spinning onto the guy's knee. Like, and the riots are doing, they do like a fireman's carry. And then the other guy hits the guy with the boot. And it's, a lot of chaotic stuff like that, but it was beautiful, beautiful. War machines. So you know how the Viking Raiders used to do a move that they called the Viking Experience, where um, I believe I believe Ivar would throw the guy up, and then Eric would catch him into a power slam. They do that here, but off the apron, or I think they try to do it on the apron, but they miss. It looked really nasty, but ultimately, the end of this match comes when. Uh, I mean, it's a war machine. They hit a, an, an insane chain of moves here, uh, like a German suplex, an assisted Ushigoroshi, a power bomb, and then Hansen, who is Ivar, for those unaware, he, uh, he goes to the second rope, but then he turns around, but then he goes to the top rope. Like, I, he built to a top rope moonsault, and the crowd popped for every modification he did when he was second rope, turn around, third rope. Uh, goes for the moonsault, Hits it on Rob Lynch, but only gets a two count. Uh, but ultimately, the London Riots are able to fight back and hit the district line, which is like a, an assisted power bomb, basically a double team. And that gives them the win. So the London Riots retain the tag team titles and uh, just a belter of a match. So you know how the, the, Will, the two Will Ospreay matches were both in the top three. This is the third one. Just an incredible match. Like I said, it is what I expected from these teams. And it was it was playing to both of their strengths and made me it it made me miss War Machine. Dude, like I know they're in WWE, you know, Eric's out with an injury, or whatever, but they did some great stuff in NXT, but ever since then, man, it's just like I don't know if they just haven't been given the spotlight or if they just spent too much time doing the goofy ass, you know. Ivar holding a turkey leg and all that shit. Like, I, I want these killers back. And I'm also not too crazy about their current, like, with Valhalla there. And they got the shields and the face paint and the beard paints. It's just like, just let these guys be killers. Just let these guys, like, we get it. We get the Viking influence. It doesn't need to be hammered on the head. Like, I don't know, man. Just just let these guys be killers. They 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 go in the ring. They can have an awesome match. Like their match with Ricochet and Alistair Black is one of my favorite matches of all time. Let these guys be killers because this match here it just made me miss that for sure. Um, so the riots retain the titles. So now the question is, who are they going to defend these titles against at Brixton? Well, we find that out in night two. When we have the follow up of one of the most like unexpected turns that I've seen in progress so far. So on chapter 33, it was the Dunn brothers, Pete Dunn and Damian Dunn, taking on Mustache Mountain, the team of Trent Seven and Tyler Bate. But Trent Seven turned on Tyler Bate and Pete Dunn turned on Damian Dunn. So now we have just kind of switched those partners. And now we have a tag team match here at chapter 35. Damian Dunn and Tyler Bate versus Pete Dunn and Trent Seven, who have acquired a new name for that this, this duo, I guess. They have a name for their tag team called British Strong Style. Yeah. 
So I know this would go on to include Tyler Bates. I don't know if this is like imminent here or if that doesn't happen till later down the line or if that's even like an on-screen thing, but this is at least the progress debut of the name British Strong Style. I mean, they even have t-shirt that this this team was seemingly only formed 2 weeks ago and they already have t-shirts that say British Strong Style on the front. They got middle fingers on the back. It's it's good shit. It's good shit. It's just um it's also cuz as of recording this uh later this week WWE is going to Perth, Australia and the tag team titles are going to be defended and the challengers are Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne which everybody I don't think they've they, they have a new name, New Catch Republic I think, but everybody online has been calling them British Strong Style. So it's cool to see like the the early foundations, the early seeds of this whole dynamic here with Tyler Bate, Pete Dunn, Trent Seven. Damian Dunn feels like the odd man out here, but I mean, he showed up in this match for sure. So respect to that. But um, just another fun tornado style tag team match. It wasn't officially a tornado match, I don't think, but that's essentially what it was. Um, a quick, I mean, it's a quick start because obviously Tyler Bate and Damian Dunn are pissed at the the double turn at the last chapter or a couple chapters before this. So the brawl starts on the outside before British strong style can even make their entrance. And, uh, it's honestly very reminiscent of the, uh, the previous match. I just talked about a lot of, you know, throwing each other into chairs, spots on the apron dives to the outside. And as I, as I'm like talking about this, let me let me throw this at you. Let me let me let me let me toss this your way and see how it tastes. Because my previous episode was covering ECW in 1996, and I've covered a lot of ECW so far on this podcast. And there's a lot of outside brawling, a lot of crowd brawling in ECW. And then now I watch this, which is what 20 years later. It's amazing how much. Like this outside brawling, like whatever that style is, it's amazing how much it's progressed, you know, whatever. Pardon the pun, but because ECW, you'll watch like the gangsters versus the eliminators, and it's just so mindless. Like nobody's selling anything. It's just walk, punch, walk, punch. Here's a piece of a table. Wow, oh, it doesn't hurt me. Punch, kick. It's all very nonsensical and hard to follow and almost boring a lot of the times. Whereas I watch it here, maybe it could be just improvement in technology. You can see more of it. The lighting's better. The cameras are better. But it's also, it just seems like there's more of a structure to it. Like it's still chaotic and it's still like a fight. But um, there just seem to be like, you know, there's like, there's like chapters in it. There's like milestones they're hitting. It's not just like, well, let's brawl for a little bit and then we'll figure it out. Like, it just, I don't know. I, I just, I, it just struck me watching this match how much I enjoy this brawling style and progress than I do in ECW, at least from what I've seen so far. But just want to throw that out there and see uh, if you disagree. If you agree, let me know. But uh, they worked their way back into the ring. Some fun double teams. There's a uh, Trent Seven has. Damien Dunn up for a pile driver and Pete Dunn kicks Damien in the face right before the pile driver. So that was a fun one, two punch there, but they they're building in this match because you know, the, the interaction you want to see coming into this is Tyler Bate and Trent seven. And they don't really come at odds until they, they all get back into the ring. Pete Dunn gets knocked to the outside. Damien Dunn gets knocked to the outside. So now it's just and Tyler and Trent, but, um, the other guys get back in the ring and they kind of start, they stop the, uh, the one-on-one -on -one interaction there. And eventually though, eventually though they do find each other and Trent hits Tyler with a dragon suplex, but Tyler hulks up. He tries to no sell it, but then gets hit with a huge power bomb by Trent seven right into a single leg crab for the tap out. So Trent seven makes Tyler bait tap out. I love he like had the single leg crab, but he was like grinding his knuckles into his knee. This is a fun little detail that I liked about that. But so British strong style gets the win here. 
And I should also mention that during this match, the guest commentators are the London Riots, the tag team champions. So BSS wins, and then they point at the Riots who are up on the stage doing commentary. They go to them, and then they start having a shoving contest, and there's a little bit of a pull apart between these two teams. So we will be seeing this match at Brixton for the tag team titles. So fun build to that, but also just a fun match here. Um, the debut of uh, BSS here, which is fun. So, but uh, hey, speaking of championships, let's talk about the Big Tasty Fuckers Championship. The Atlas title tournament continues and comes to a culmination. Well, it'll, it'll it'll culminate at Brixton, but we find out what the finals are going to be, and we find out which two tasty fuckers are going to compete to be the inaugural 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 champion at chapter 36. But on the way there, we got a few matches on night one to set up the two semifinal matches on night two. And of course those two uh, semifinal winners will face each other at Brixton. So how do we get there? I'm not even going to bother recapping the scores because honestly, like look at this tournament, with progress is the nature of it. And it was, it's kind of the same thing I thought about like all the natural progression tournaments, the first few that they've done, they just span such a long time to the point where you like forget <laughs> where anybody like who's in it, who was in the hunt, like all that stuff. Right. And I think nowadays, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I could look this up, but I won't. I believe the natural progression tournaments, or like a like a weekend thing. Like they just do it all at once. I could be a little bit wrong there, but the Atlas tournament is kind of along the same vein. It, it started fucking 18 years ago, it feels like. And but we're here now. It's a round robin tournament, two blocks of four people. And basically the people were in the in the running at this point. Well, I'll just talk about it. So the first, I guess, quarterfinal match would be um Dave Mastiff taking on Easton Reese. And I've talked about Easton Reese. I think his name's stupid. I think his name is unfinished. But the guy has a good fucking look, man. I, I, I noted this. I don't know why it just came to mind. I think Easton Reese would be, uh, would fucking rule in like 2004 SmackDown. You know, you have all these big, handsome, jacked up dudes wearing tights and short hair. Like everybody kind of looked the same. Easton Reese, and Reese kind of falls under that category, but his end rings, I would say it's better. Easton Reese is a better wrestler than fucking Luther Reigns or Mark Jindrak or Chris Masters or whatever the fuck. So respect to Easton Reese, but he didn't really make much of an impression on me in this tournament, but dude has a killer look to him. Oh, for sure. He's a tasty, tasty dish. And then on the other side, you got Dave Mastiff, who is, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's a tasty dish as well. But he's, uh, I mean, Easton Reese is like a big slab of elk, whereas Dave Mastiff is a fucking ribeye. He's just a big, beefy boy. But um, their match here, night one, honestly didn't do a lot for me. It was very short. They, they kind of took turns doing impressive power moves against each other. Uh, Reese hits a big fallaway slam onto Dave Mastiff. Dave Mastiff's a big boy, so that was very impressive. But ultimately... Uh, Mastiff just wins with a fucking small package <laughs> out of nowhere. So Mastiff wins and moves on to the semifinals at night two. Um, also, there's a sexual chocolate chance in this match, which is unclear if they were referring to like Easton Reese, Reese's pieces, or if Dave Mastiff is just big and sexy white chocolate. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's both. Maybe it maybe just applies to all of the above. But so that was a match that happened. And also in night one, we get to see who faces Dave Mastiff in the semifinals on night two. We got Michael Dante versus Joe Coffey. Uh, this match was, was better than the first one as far as the Atlas tournament goes. Uh, it, it, big, big lads slapping meat. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Just have these big lads go in there and slap each other and run into each other and dock each other and all that stuff. So, I mean, it starts off, you get your, your obligatory big dick contest with the shouldering each other. Yeah, you hit the ropes there, lad. Damn, man. Or however Scott's talk. 
Um, Scottish is the worst accent, by the way. I just got to get that out there. It's fucking un- insufferable. Um, <laughs> sorry for my Scottish listeners. But um, we get some we get some brawling on the outside, some forearm battles. A lot of smooth counters in this match. You know, Michael Dante, who's, you know, the the, the secondary guy teaming with Tommy End. And then you got Joe Coffey, who's a part of Gallus today. So on paper, you might not expect a lot out of this. But um, I thought it was a really good match. Both guys just going for bombs the entire match. No chain wrestling here. It's just, you know, I'm going to hit you with this fucking power bomb, And then I'm going to hit you with this suplex and lariats and all that stuff. But ultimately, Joe Coffey is able to hit a short arm lariat to the back of the head of Michael Dante and then hits him with the full fledged discus lariat, which he calls all the best for the bells. Hits Dante with it, pins him one, two, three. And uh, gets the win here. So Joe Coffey goes on to face Dave Mastiff in night two, which we'll talk about shortly. And uh, but before we get there, we can't have a progress review without talking about the origin here i am on the road again all right sorry i get really i get really excited but the origins here minus nathan cruz i don't know what's he's just wrestling somewhere else or if he's injured or what what have you i know he's on chapter 36 but he's not here on on this month but the other three guys are represented uh, El Liguero, Dave Mastiff, Zach Gibson. We got two of those boys. Night two, we have a, a four-way match. It is El Liguero versus Zach Gibson versus Eddie Dennis versus Jack Gallagher. Just want to touch on this one real quick. Probably the most purely entertaining <laughs> match because you got the two origin guys against Eddie Dennis and Jack Gallagher, who are two of the most lighthearted, you know, fan-friendly guys. It's almost more of a tag match at a lot of points, but then you got the leaning tension when, you know, like the origin guys, they come face to face during the match and then the crowd starts chanting sexual tension, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, but Zach Gibson, so I've talked about his whole thing with his his ring introductions. He, he'll he grab the mic and he'll say, you know, I'm soon to be recognized as uh, progress is number one, the world's number one, all that stuff. And the crowd always boos him out of the building. I mean, to the point where you can barely hear what he's saying. But uh, Zach, Zach Gibson, one thing about this boy. He's a thinker. So as the crowd is booing him, he hands the mic to El Liguero. Gibson goes to the backstage area, comes back out with a megaphone. (laughs) I'll just I'll let this speak for itself. So it's a lot of that. I mean, the match is what it is. It's a pretty entertaining match. Um, <laughs> there's one point where Zach Gibson and uh, Liguero come face to face, like I mentioned, and then they like fake hit each other, like slow motion chops and slow motion forearms. And by the way, you got Dave Mastiff on commentary, who is obviously their stable mate. So Dave Mastiff, here, I'll just, I'll, I'll let it play. This, of course, is a four way. One fall to a finish, man. Well, let me tell you something, Glenn. Business has just picked up. We've got El Ligero, and we've got Zach Gibson Limpo's number one. Think it through, lads. No one cares about you, Glenn. This is... Hey, listen, listen to these divs. Listen to what they're saying to my mates. Is there any sexual tension in the origin? Definitely not. We get it regular. Lads, what are you doing? Oh, look at this strong. Both these guys! 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 Devastating. Fight forever! Fight forever! <laughs> so, at some point also, 
because here's another thing, another running thread through all these recaps and all these shows. Um, the crowd loves to chant, where's my car stereo at Zach Gibson, because Zach is from Liverpool. And uh, from what I gather, it's not a very friendly place. And I guess your car stereo is uh, apt to get stolen in Liverpool. So what has Zach done? Well, now he has under the ring a car stereo. He pulls out a stereo and tries to hit Eddie Dennis with it, but um, ends up missing. Ultimately, Leguero goes for his C4L DDT onto Jack Gallagher. But Gallagher counters into a single leg Boston Crab with an ankle lock, kind of. It was very, it looked excruciating, whatever it was. But Leguero taps and Jack Gallagher gets the win. And uh, I mentioned this last time, but he's coming off of the, the, uh, the Cruiserweight Classic, or he's about to at least. So, But he has a lot of momentum behind him. So Jack gets the win. He pretty much does nothing but win here in progress is what it seems like. But uh, but Origin does do a little Pearl Harbor job afterwards. They eventually hit both guys, both Eddie Dennis and Jack Gallagher with the car stereo. They lay them out and uh, I believe that builds to a match at chapter 36. So we got that cooking. I throw this into the Atlas talk because Dave Mastiff was a part of that. And you know, right after the match, because Dave Mastiff's already out there, he has his semi-final match against Joe Coffey. I'll say this, Mastiff, Joe Coffey, maybe the best match of the tournament. I'll say that. There's been some good matches. But, um, man, it's just like, I think the face heel dynamic of this match works really well. And I say that just because, like, it popped in my mind during this match because I'm watching this, and you got like Dave Mastiff. Obviously, he's part of the origin, so he's being a proper dickhead, and he is doing all these power bombs and the sent tons and the cannonballs in the corner. An easy guy, like a very palatable like villain, like a very oh, this guy's a a, a fucking brick shit house. How are you gonna take him down? Then Joe Coffee. The dude, he, like, he's flying all over the place and not flying like, you know, springboards and intricate moon salts or whatever the hell. It's just like, it's just like a high energy to him. Like he'll be, he'll do running strikes in the corner, flying uppercuts. He'll like jump off the top rope and roll to evade Dave Mastiff. And he just like in general, just a very energetic, lively character Joe Coffey is. And this came to mind watching this is because their runs in WWE, Dave Mastiff no longer there, but Joe Coffey's still there in Gallus. They always kind of came off or come off to me as like side players, like B players, not B as in like, you know, they're not that great, but they just always, they never seem to be the top of the top. Like they always seem maybe like a beat, like a gatekeeper role, lower mid card type guy, never super engaged in anything they're involved in on TV. But I'm watching them here because they're both opposites of what they were in WWE or in Joe, Joe, Joe's case still is. And it makes me wonder, like, should Gallus be baby faces? I guess they were baby faces a little bit in NXT UK. And honestly, I thought they thrived in that as that as well for their run there. And Dave Mastiff feels, like, oh, I'm good old Dave Mastiff. I'm a big old boy. But here he's just he's, he's a dickhead and it comes off so this feels like more of effective character positions for these two guys. I mean, you look at Dave Mast, I mean, big tasty fucker. <laughs> he was he was the one that initially when they announced this when they announced this Atlas Championship, he was like, "Oh, I can't wait to see what big tasty fuckers are going to be involved in this tournament." But you look at Dave Mastiff and I big tasty fucker, I can't conjure up a better <laughs> description for this guy. And um also in this match, by the way, the match is incredible. They break the ring in the process. I believe it's like a Joe Coffey comes off the top with a missile drop kick and misses, but he takes a bump on the in the ring and the board comes up or something. But then Joe later in the match, Joe does a springboard cross body into the ring and that like fixes it seemingly. <laughs> so um Really need to, you know, they always hear on commentary. Oh, I hope they reinforce the ring for this one. Maybe they should have here. I don't know. Joe Coffey ends up winning with the discus lariat once again, beating Dave Mastiff and goes on to the finals 
in Brixton to compete to be the inaugural Progress Atlas champion. But who will face him? You may be asked, and I know you all are yelling that at your radio, but the hardest part of the ring, who is Joe Coffey facing for the Atlas Championship? Well, you just hold on for a goddamn second, let me tell you. We got also on night two, we got Rampage Brown versus T Bone. And uh, another semifinal match. So obviously, the winner of this will face Joe Coffey in Brixton. And I'm going to be honest Rampage, T Bone, I was very distracted. During this one, uh, my wife happened to sit down next to me as I was watching this. And look, progress. <laughs> one thing about progress, I should say, I don't know if I've mentioned, they have tremendous camera work. Like it looks beautiful. It looks almost cinematic progress wrestling, especially I'm like, I've been watching Rev Pro and OTT. And of course, I've watched like Ring of Honor and you know, I've been watching PWG and WXW and whatnot, and it's like all these independent shows, these promotions, they have similar camera work, but Progress Wrestling just had this, it just looks really good. Like the smoke in the background, the lighting, it all just looks really good. But this uh has <laughs> detrimental effects when the camera is just zoned in on the gooch of these big hairy bastards in this ring. I don't know what it was about this match, but it seemed like every time Rampage was on his back, the camera just got right into his dick and balls. And Rampage is a hairy fella. It's not exactly what you need. Like, God bless him. I know it makes you aerodynamic, these trunks. But man, I don't know how he keeps that package in there, this Rampage Brown. And T-Bone, all right, T-Bone. He has a singlet in this match. It's maybe the worst singlet I've ever seen in my life. It's too small you know it's like imagine you are wearing a singlet and you had like ropes attached to your shoulder straps and it was pulling the shoulder straps up to the point where you're getting an atomic wedgie that's how this singlet just felt by default like it felt like it was all the way up there and it just didn't look good it was very very bad so i was very distracted by all of the it was just a lot. It was a lot to take in. Um, but T-Boner eventually hits a tombstone, or he gets it countered. And uh, Rampage hits a tombstone of his own. Hits a stump pile driver. So it hits a tombstone, Rampage does, and then a stump pile driver. And then T-Bone gets up. He's like, give me, well, give me some more. Come on, then. Or whatever. Whatever you guys say. And then Rampage is like, all right. And then hits a big old pile driver. One of the most brutal pile drivers I've ever seen. I mean, T-Bone's neck. Rest in, rest in peace, T-Bone's neck on this one. But Rampage gets the win. The match was what it was, but Rampage gets the win with a brutal pile driver and sets up the finals. Rampage Brown versus Joe Coffey at Brixton for the Atlas Championship. And it's interesting because Joe Coffey and Rampage fought each other uh, within the tournament, and it went to a draw. So, still unfinished business there. So, that'll be a uh, cool little story to tie up at Brixton. And looking forward to crown the first ever Atlas champion. But, um, let's touch on the women. for Well, okay, that was a bad way to phrase it. Let's touch on the subject of women's wrestling <laughs> on this month. Um, so night one, I'll just touch on this briefly. So we got a six, a six person tag match, Jack Sexsmith, Pollyanna and Roy Johnson taking on the South Pacific power trio, Dahlia Black, TK Cooper and Travis Banks, who, uh, recently debuted in progress. Jack Sexsmith and Roy Johnson are typically like comedy based characters, but they were all business here. We got a kind of a blood feud brewing between these because the power trio had been like TK Cooper had been just punched Pollyanna in the face <laughs> several times to cost her matches. And these, these teams have been at odds for quite a while now, but ultimately even though Jack sex Smith locks in Mr. Kako on TK Cooper, which if you're unaware, it's Mr. Sacco, but with a condom, um, He's able to fight out of it, and they hit this sick triple team where TK Cooper hits Sexsmith 
with a Death Valley driver after Dahlia double stomps him. And then he lands on <laughs> Travis Banks's knees. So it's like a very <laughs> wacky, like if, if, you've, if you've played Mousetrap, <laughs> the board game, it's very like a lot of different things have to happen for this move to hit. But it looked pretty cool for what it was. So the Dahlia Black, TK Cooper and Travis Banks get the win there. And it should be said that uh, the women's title is not a thing yet, but there will be a tournament that commentary says is going to start in the autumn. Sometimes they say autumn over there, I guess it starts in the fall. Uh, so probably after chapter 36, because it is not happening at Brixton, but Pollyanna and Dahlia black, I would assume would be a part of that tournament. And two other ladies that I would assume would be a part of this tournament are Laura DeMatteo and Ginny. And they are involved in a mixed tag match on night one. It is Laura DeMatteo and Mark Haskins versus Ginny and Marty Skrull. So very interesting uh, to see the women kind of involved here in the uh, the world title picture because Marty is Marty Skrull just won his progress championship back from Pastor William Ever the last chapter, and Mark Haskins is the number one contender. So they are both involved here. And uh, I mean, not, not a ton to say about this match. It was, it was a pretty fun match. Honestly, I thought Ginny and Laura uh, had a lot more chemistry here than their previous singles match. Um, it's been a long standing story with those two ladies, how, you know, Laura was like the uh, the servant of Ginny and then she fought back. And now we have, you know, the the rivalry brewing between those two. And Laura got the win over Ginny. Um, is either chapter 23 or, or is either chapter 33 or 32. So Jenny obviously wants revenge and then Mark Haskins and Marty Skrull want at each other. Of course, <laughs> the finish of this match comes when um, so Mark Haskins goes to hit Marty Skrull with a super kick. But Marty pulls in Laura, who is Mark Haskins partner, pulls Laura in and Mark Haskins accidentally kicks the shit out of Laura DiMatteo. And Marty ends up throwing Mark Haskins out of the ring and Jenny is able to capitalize on this and pins a knocked out Laura De Mateo. So still furthering that feud. And again, I assume they'll probably cross paths in the tournament, but we shall see. But more to say on Haskins and uh, Skrull later in this. But we just need to touch on some debuts here in the women's division as well. On night two, Alex Windsor versus Nixon Newell. Newell? Newell? Newell. Let's say Newell. Uh, Nixon Newell, you might know her as Tegan Knox debuting here in progress. And Alex Windsor, that's a name I've always heard, but this is my first proper match. I feel like I've seen of her. Uh, I thought this was a really good. Match. I thought it was a solid match. You know, nothing too over the top. Nothing that'll make you write a letter to your mother talking about it. But it was fun. Nixon is super over at this point. I know she's made a splash in other promotions during this time period. She comes out to <laughs> say la vie by bewitched, which was funny. I mean, you know, the ending stretch of this match, you have Nixon hits the shiniest wizard, but Windsor rolls out of the ring to avoid being pinned. And then Nixon tries to go for a suicide dive, but Windsor kicks her to block it, hits a tornado DDT on the floor. Uh, but Nixon's able to fight back with a roundhouse kick and a tiger suplex with a bridge for the win. So Nixon, AKA Tegan Knox gets the win in her debut in progress. Great intensity in this match was my note. I thought both la both ladies were clearly trying to make a name for themselves. They clearly saw the big stage that this was. Cause a lot of times women's matches are kind of relegated to the endeavor shows, but this is a pretty big spotlight for these two. And I was, I was, Pretty impressed. I mean, I love Alex Windsor kind of seemed like a no nonsense cut type of gal. Her, her attire, funny enough, kind of reminded me of Mark Haskins, where just like the black tights, the black boots, um, not necessarily like the MM MMA style or anything. But I thought it was very, very intense. Good uh, strike based offense from these two. I guess is how I would describe it. But looking forward to seeing more of them in the future. But uh, before we get to the main events, before we get to the world title picture and how that all pans out. Let's talk about Sebastian, <laughs> Sebastian and Pastor William Ever. 
two pro Joe guys, two young up and comers. Pastor William Ever, of course, just lost his world title at Chapter Thirty Three to uh, Marty Skrull due to interference from Sebastian, and it was very, it was very random. You know, we talked about it. It's like we didn't understand what the what the motivation was for Sebastian interfering and what the story is here. But basically we we were left at chapter 33 with Sebastian saying that he knew a secret of pastors and he was going to tell the world. So here, uh, chapter 35, Sebastian comes out seemingly to explain his actions. And he basically says that pastor was an unworthy champion. And, um, Sebastian's basically jealous because, you know, Sebastian and Pastor William Ever, they came in at the same time, but the pastor gained this popularity, whereas Sebastian kind of just fizzled away. So he calls out Pastor. Pastor comes out. And because uh, remember, Sebastian allegedly has a secret over Pastor, but Sebastian's like, I'm not even going to say it. I want you to stew on the fact that I know the secret and I want you to be bothered by it. And I want you to be terrified of me letting it out again. I, don't, I have no idea what this is. If this even leads to anything, Sebastian has a, has a chair and he says he wants pastor to hit him with the chair, which is very like, I'm confused here as to why pastor would not hit him with the chair. Is that just cause that's not who pastor is. He doesn't, does he not know how to use a chair? I mean, he does Jesus not sit in chairs? I guess not. Probably right. He probably just sits on water or whatever. So it's a bit confusing. Pastor is kind of just stoic out there. Is not you would think he'd be a little more angry, but again, maybe that's that's just the stoic nature of his religious character. But um, Sebastian's trying to get him to hit him with a chair. He slaps him in the face. He spits in his beard, but nothing. And then Sebastian just eventually gets fed up with it and hits Pastor with a low blow and kicks the shit out of him with the chair for a while, like several chair shots to the back. Security comes out, pulls him off. And um, but he's able to he fights his way back and wraps Pastor's arm in the chair, then grabs another chair and concertos Pastor's arm with it. So uh, this this all just felt very weird. It's still I'm still confused as to why this is happening. Really, it seemed very like in a very abrupt character shift in Sebastian because initially he was like a comedic tag team guy with Tom what's his face, and um, now he all of a sudden he's just a dickhead. So, and Pastor, like I said, I feel like I feel like he should have been more angry. I don't know. Maybe 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 this will all pan out and explain itself, but. Just a weird little segment on at the end of night two, but let's let's close this baby out talking about the progress world title. So let's just basically what we're going to do here is we're going to set the scene for Brixton, because as it stands after, you know, as chapter 33 came to a close, Mark Haskins had won the number one contendership. And also, Marty Skrull walked out the world title. So we're led to believe that it's going to be Marty Skrull versus Mark Haskins in Brixton. However, we have some potential modifications to this match. So on night one, we got a progress world title contendership match. So it's Tommy End versus a mystery opponent. And the stipulation is that if Tommy End wins, he gets added to the world title main event at Brixton. So, and the mystery opponent is chosen by the current world champion, Marty Skrull, who ends up picking Zach Gibson to face Tommy end, which was a decent, pretty decent match. The ending stretch, you have Gibson hitting the lung blower off the second rope to Tommy end. Um, but he's able to get the ropes to break the pin. And then there's some roll up trading, submission trading, uh, Gibson locks in the Shankly gates on Tommy ends, but he rolls through it and counters into a dragon sleeper. So there's some pretty seamless chain wrestling in addition to all the striking and whatnot. But ultimately Zach Gibson goes for another lung blower off the second rope, but Tommy end counters with a flying knee and then hits the black mass kick for the win. So Tommy end wins and earns his way 
into the world title match at Brixton, therefore making it a triple threat match. Tommy End versus Mark Haskins versus whoever the world champion is at the end of this month. So that brings us to night two, where we have another match that has title match implications. It is Mikey Whiplash versus Mark Haskins. And if Haskins loses, uh, Whiplash gains his number one contendership. So it'll be Mikey Whiplash replacing Mark Haskins in the main event at Brixton if Whiplash beats Haskins here. But don't worry about that because Haskins kicks the shit out of Whiplash. And well, not really, actually, because Whiplash actually dominates a lot of this match. Actually, I should mention how how this stipulation came to be, because both guys come out for the match and then Whiplash grabs the mic, who he's still pissed because he beat Jimmy Havoc in a non-title match like years ago at this point and never got a title match. So he's desperate for a title match. And he basically says, hey, Mark, look, if you're going to go win and become a champion, you're going to have to defend that title anyways. So why not just ha- add another defense? Like he's trying to trying to convince Mark to put his number one contendership on the line. And he resorts to calling him a little bitch. And he said, why you be a little bitch in front of your wife? Because his wife's there. And then calls his son a bastard. It's like, Jesus. Um, then Haskins is like, all right, motherfucker, let's do it. That's a quote, by the way. And Whiplash controls a lot of this match. It's a power bomb on Haskins into the ring post. Uh, hits him with another one in the ring. And then rolls him into a Death Valley driver. But only gets a two count. And um, Mark Haskins is able to fight back. It's this really explosive suicide dive to the outside. Rolls him in the ring. Hits him with like a fireman's carry into a face buster. Almost like an F5 type of move. Hits him with a super kick. And then locks in the bridging arm bar for the submission. So Haskins gets the win over Whiplash. And a uh, pretty good match. It's more like... I find that Haskins matches are typically like very like boom, boom, boom. But this one kind of was a little bit extended a little bit more of a classic heel getting heat type of thing. But I thought it worked for what it was. I'm starting to whiplash's character is growing on me a little bit. Just kind of a creepy asshole. That's basically how I would describe it. But and Haskins, I'll, I'll love anything Haskins in, is involved in. So but that extended nature of the match also like made when, when Haskins fired up and made it just amplified the emotion and everything. So I thought this worked for me. So we got Haskins solidifying his spot in the main event at Brixton. And we got Tommy end also involved. So the only question is who's going to be the world champion going into Brixton. So that's where we have Marty Skrull versus Mark Andrews night Two progress world championship match. It's it's the one defense that Marty made this month. Honestly, kind of a random matchup. I don't know necessarily what Mark Andrews I guess maybe the thought process is that we're leading into Brixton, the biggest show in the history of progress. And Mark Andrews is like the guy that's always been there. And he got screwed out of the title. Like he won the title, but got screwed from it from Jimmy Havoc. So let's, let's give this boy a shot to enter Brixton as the champion. I guess was the story here, but which oddly. So, so this match, so you got Mark Haskins is on commentary here. And honestly, the story here is almost more so. <laughs> Even it's Marty Skrull and Mark Andrews, it's almost the story is more with Mark Haskins. Because eventually, you know, Marty and Mark Andrews, they fight to the stage. They're brawling on the stage where the commentary table is and Mark Haskins is. Marty has a chair and he's threatening to hit Mark Andrews with it. But instead, he turns around and chucks it at Mark Haskins. And just like the sound... Of like the headset falling off and the chair hitting them. Oh, maybe I'll throw some audio in here. I mean, it's <laughs> just aesthetically pleasing to the ears. Oh, wait, I'm busted. I'm busted. Haskins is allegedly busted open. He gets taken to the back. Meanwhile, Marty threatens to gorilla press Mark Andrews off of the stage into the crowd. But Andrews scurries off. He hits him with a low blow so that Marty kind of rolls off the stage. 
But then Andrews hits a stage dive off with a flipping senton into the crowd onto Marty Skrull. Really cool visual. Um, but they fight back into the ring, and Marty's able to hit a suplex into a chicken wing. But Mark Andrews gets to the ropes. We got some ref shoving. We got the classic angle, <laughs> the classic spot where, you know, Marty's shoving the ref. He keeps shoving him, and then eventually the ref just is like, I'm gonna shove you. And then he shoves him into a roll up, and then a one, two kick. This really, really fun energy towards the end here. Uh, Mark Andrews goes for his shooting star press. Hits it on Marty Skrull. One, two, foot on the ropes. The crowd popped. I think the crowd thought that he won because uh, the ref actually hit the mat on three, but uh, didn't see the feet. So match continues. More chaos. And then among the chaos, Marty Skrull locks in the chicken wing and gets the tap out. So Marty retains the title in a pretty good match. Um, so he will go on. So this completes the picture. So at Brixton, we will have a triple threat match. Marty Skrull defending against Tommy End and Mark Haskins, which who daddy? I uh, I am looking forward to that one. Absolutely. So and then you know, after Marty wins, the origin comes out to beat up on Mark Andrews, which I don't know. I'm sure they don't like each other for some reason. I guess they they, they traded the tag titles a little bit, but. Uh, renewing that rivalry, I guess. So they're triple teaming Mark Andrews, but then out come Eddie Dennis, Jack Gallagher, and Damon Moser. Who Moser and Nathan Nathan Cruz had a thing with the origin, and so you got this brawl to end the show with Andrew WK playing. Everyone fights their way to different exits of the arena, and then Mark M Marty comes back and locks in the chicken wing on Mark Andrews. It's a very chaotic end to this show. Um, but Mark Haskins comes back to make the save. He's got a patch on his forehead uh, from the chair previously. Hits him with a super kick and ends the show holding up the title. So that sets the scene for Brixton. We're going to have an eight-man tag uh, with a lot of the guys that were brawling on this show and the triple threat. We got the Atlas Championship Finals between Joe Coffey and Rampage Brown. We got the London Riots defending the tag titles against British Strong Style. We got the third match of the series between Tommaso Ciampa and Zack Sabre Jr. We got, it's on cage match, it says there's a dark no disqualification match between Pastor William Ever and Sebastian. I'm wondering, like, why wouldn't that be on TV? But it's like, maybe they don't have faith in it. I don't know. Or maybe it's dark. Maybe there's just like no lights in <laughs> There's no lights in the arena, and that's why it's called dark. But um, and then there's a six woman tag: Alex Windsor, Dahlia Black, and Jenny versus Laura De Matteo, Nixon Newell, and Pollyanna. So giving them some shine on this big show. So that's basically what we got for Brixton. That'll be the next progress review that I do. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're following, and all of that happy horse shit. But that's about all Daddy has for you today. Appreciate you guys tuning in. It's always a fun time checking out these progress shows and uh, giving a giving a gander, giving giving a little uh, talking my way through them. Hopefully you're enjoying them, and hopefully you enjoy me, and hopefully you'll spit in my mouth and call me a little bitch. So that's it. Y'all take care now. Appreciate you stopping by. Rate, rate, review, subscribe. Yeah, I already said it. Just get out of here. Why are you still here? Go, go. I'm hard. Yeah.